Order members, and welcome to this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on COVID-19 Response. Item 1 on the agenda, minutes of proceedings of the previous meeting held on the 30th of April. Members are asked to note these minutes which Mr Stalford has agreed. Members should also note the minutes of evidence from the meeting have been published on the official report uh, which is available on the committee's website page. Members, before we move on, I want to refer to the fact that we have just one ministerial statement today. On the 30th of April, the Minister of Justice informed the Speaker's office that she wished to make a statement to the committee at today's meeting. However, yesterday afternoon, the Speaker's office received notice from the Minister that she wished to defer her meeting, making her statement until next week. As a result, the Speaker's office notified all members yesterday that there would just be the one minister on this occasion. Item number two, a statement from the Minister for the Economy. The Speaker re received notification on the 28th of April that the Minister wished to make her statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at today's meeting. A copy of the Minister's statement uh, that she intends making is included in your pack at page seven. I'd like to welcome the Minister for the Economy to this meeting of the committee. Uh, but before the Minister makes her statement, I want to remind members that following it, there will be an opportunity for questions not to make speeches. Members who ask sharp, focused questions will be afforded an opportunity to make a supplementary, as happened on the previous occasion. However, if it's a bit long-winded, I may have to move on. I would also seek the cooperation of the Minister, because we wish to afford every member who has come along here today an opportunity to ask questions, if she can endeavour to be succinct in her answers as well. <coughs> um, I therefore intend to follow the same approach as happened previously. I invite the Minister to make her statement, which should be heard by members without interruption. Point of order, Mr. Allister, and can I can I highlight uh, uh, this is not the assembly where normal points of orders would be taken, but I, I'll, I'll hear what you have to say. You said in your introduction that copies of this statement had been circulated. I can only speak for myself, but I understand others are in the same position. Certainly, I have received no copy of this statement, uh, so I'd like to know how and when it was distributed, and why has the process failed? Uh, a meeting of today's ad hoc committee uh, was included in the electronic pack, which would have been uh, circulated to, to members and made available for them to access uh, with all the relevant papers. Um, certainly, if member, any member finds that that did not happen, if they would come back to the Speaker's office, uh, we will investigate further. But I understand that it would have been circulated and made available electronically, uh, and I hope we can now move on. Minister. I have no idea. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, and thank you to colleagues um, for the opportunity um, to address members uh, once again on the critical issues around the economy, and particularly as this crisis unfolds. It is now two months since the dramatic but necessary changes to our way of life were first implemented. Sadly, what was once unimaginable is now the new reality. I took office just under four short months ago. Back then, I set out an ambition to introduce parental bereavement leave, grow our tourism sector, stimulate investment in job creation, and importantly, direct more funding into skills for our future generations. Yet in what seemed like a heartbeat, the brutal impact of coronavirus on the health of our population and on our economy has transformed these priorities. Make no mistake, the top priority is still the preservation of life, and this will remain our primary focus until such times as the threat of COVID-19 has sufficiently diminished. Our next and necessary priority is to mitigate the impacts on our economy as best we can and do all in our part to aid recovery. We have lived through downturns, but this is different. The usual remedy of encouraging people to go out and spend money to boost the economy 
is not possible or indeed appropriate right now. The Executive, like our counterparts in London, has acted swiftly and decisively. We have redirected resources to cushion the devastating early impacts, and we will continue to do so. This week, we received executive approval for £40 million to set up a hardship fund for micro-businesses. This will aid thousands of our smallest enterprises, as well as charities and social enterprises. The financial grant schemes for business rates relief, bank lending scheme, job retention scheme and support for the self-employed have been essential in preventing the economy from imploding. The painstakingly deliberate pace of deploying government policy, developing government policy has been replaced with immediate action to deliver the targeted assistance that projects, protects as many incomes as possible. As of yesterday, over 19,000 payments of £10,000 have been issued to small businesses, totalling £190 million. We have received over 3,000 applications for the recently opened 25,000 scheme, with over 800 payments already having been made. Be in no doubt we are truly in uncharted waters, and normal rules no longer apply. By effectively putting our economy into a deep freeze, allowing employers to retain staff by furloughing them, we have ushered many businesses away from failure. However, there is a direct link between the population's health and the health of the economy. The longer people are away from the workplace, the greater the impact will be on our economy. Crucially, however, this significant government intervention will also assist recovery. Businesses can ramp up much more quickly when they retain their workforce and institutional knowledge. We are prepared for the possibility that economic recovery will not be as rapid as the decline. Government, both nationally and locally, will again need to support businesses across various sectors. However, I believe in the Northern Ireland business community. Many businesses faced the economic downturn in 2008 and emerged more efficient. Today, they are adapting once more, demonstrating agility and resilience in the face of adversity. They have stepped up to the challenge by doing what is necessary. Some companies have repurposed production lines to build the ventilators. Others are importing uh, PPE. Others have found new ways to reach and support customers. There is no such thing as a non-essential business in a modern economy. The importance of the interconnected supply chains and support networks has demonstrated our reliance on those who produce and sell food, keep the lights on and keep freight moving. New business models are already beginning to emerge as a result of the disruption. Many companies have become more local and less global in the short to medium term. Our daily work patterns are transforming. We have all become much more accustomed to working remotely, using technology to hold video conferences, or conducting business without the need to travel. Many who are preparing to join the workforce are now learning from home. Further education colleges and universities are delivering support to students through virtual and remote learning. This is essential because a fully skilled workforce will form part of the foundation of recovery. This week I announced that we have moved 25, removed the 25% employer contribution to skills focus. This will allow furloughed staff to gain accredited qualifications and return to ups, work upskilled. Yesterday, my department launched a pilot postgraduate course in software development with Queen's University, offering a fully funded part-time course for individuals whose careers have been impacted by COVID-19. My department has also partnered with the Open University to provide online learning that is free for workers. And while this year it is impossible for our further and higher education students to sit exams in a conventional way, it is good that arrangements are in place for them to receive their qualifications and move forward into the workplace or go on to further study. We will need their skills when the time comes. The darkest days of this economic disaster are not at all behind us yet. We still need to help business survive. Incomes must be protected. 
but we also need to start plotting a course to recovery. This week, the executive announced it would match fund 562 million for city and growth deals and 55 million for the Inclusive Futures Fund. And it will provide up to an additional 100 million for complementary projects in other areas outside the Northwest. This is a crucial injection of funding for all the regions of Northern Ireland. Under the four city and growth deals, my department will play a central role in delivering this investment. We will support important new projects in innovation, in the digital economy, in skills and in tourism. Set alongside the UK investment, this raises the funding for the Belfast area to 700 million, while mid South West is 252 million, funding for the North West is 210, and for Causeway Coast and Glens, 72 million. Not only is this investment essential as we rebuild, it will continue to boost our economy over the next decade. And while I remain firmly focused on today, I am also looking at tomorrow. I am working closely with our business community, our hospitality sector and tourism industry to help them take the first steps to recovery. I have been in discussions with representatives of business about how we can get things moving again by supporting businesses that can work safely to get back to work. I am re-establishing the economic advisory group that was previously in place to advise my predecessors. I want to ensure that we concentrate on rebuilding an economy that focuses on the areas where we are genuinely world class, such as tourism, where the greatest opportunities for our young people lie. I have set up the Tourism Recovery Steering Group to bring the most influential figures in that sector together to begin the process of bringing their industry back to where it needs to be. Yesterday, I sat in on the first meeting of the Tourism Working Group, established for the sector to identify the key issues that that steering group will need to address. Yes, our focus is still on fighting the most immediate and severest impact of the crisis, but it is important that we also start to get the economy moving again and gradually see people safely return to work. The truth is that we don't know for certain how long this disruption will last, but we simply cannot shut the economy down for a significant period of time without suffering catastrophic consequences. We stand ready to facilitate a safe return to work when the time is right. This should not be viewed as a trade-off between people's health and the economy. The two are inextricably linked and it is important that government, business and wider society recognises and accepts that. I will continue to support our economy through this period of adversity, but I also pledge all that I can do to re restore its confidence. And that is why we need to be decisive in our policy choices, adapt to the new global business environment quickly, and focus on the sectors where Northern Ireland can genuinely be a world leader. Thank you. I thank the Minister for her statement, and there will now be a period of questions that will last for approximately an hour. I remind members of what I said at the start of the meeting, that they should not preface their question with a, a statement or a speech, uh, but be too concise. There will be an opportunity to ask a supplementary question, provided members uh, cooperate. Uh, I will afford them that opportunity. Otherwise, I may have to go on. Finally, I would also encourage the minister to give concise and focused questions to members, quest answers to members' questions. The chair of the Committee for the Economy will, as normal, be given some additional latitude. So I now call the Chair of the Economy Committee, Kiva Archibald. Thank you um, And I thank the Minister for, for her statement today and for giving us that update. Um, and the announcement of the, the hardship fund this week ha has been very welcome. Um, businesses may have been hoping for some more detail on the eligibility criteria today, so they may be a wee bit disappointed about that. Um, I would just like to also um, reiterate some of the, the gaps in the schemes that have been announced to date. Obviously, the grant support has been really, really welcome, but we heard from the Chambers of Commerce yesterday, particularly in relation to 
hospitality and retail businesses who are above the 51,000 in terms of NAV and have been unable to access support. Obviously, there's work going on around further rates relief, but um, these, they highlight the need for cash support right now. Um, and then, just secondly, in relation to um, the statement last week from CBI and IBEC, they, they wrote to the First Ministers and to the Taoiseach about the need for all-Ireland cooperation and coordination in planning for the recovery. And you mentioned it, um, the re-establishment of the Economic Advisory Group in your statement. I was wondering, have you um, contacted the departments in the South about trying to coordinate that, that work and a potential setting up of a, an advisory group on an all-Ireland basis in terms of the recovery? Um, can I thank the Chair for her uh, questions and also for her cooperation in the work that we do to support the economy. Um, we have uh, weekly uh, conversations about the work um, of the Department um, and the support that the Committee uh, can be in encouraging and talking and discussing some of the issues that are about. So, um, first of all, in terms of the hardship fund, I am really pleased that we have secured a further 40 uh, million from the executive um, in relation to the hardship fund. Um, that hardship fund, I hope, will be, um, and I will set out the, the full uh, criteria um, at the start of next week, um, but that will be targeted at small and micro businesses those businesses that employ one to nine people um, and where uh, those people are paid through a PAYE scheme. Um, it will uh, be open to um, small micro businesses, it will be open to social economy businesses um, and uh, to charities who are trading institutions. Um, but I will set out the full detail next week and currently Invest NI are building the portal um, so that we can get that online as early as we possibly can because we uh, anticipate significant demand. We've set some uh, rules around it, um, which will be that if you've qualified, obviously, for the 10K grant or the 25K grant, then it would be inappropriate for you to be doubly funded uh, while other businesses um, are not funded. So there are some rules around it as well, ar around that particular issue. Um, so uh, that, that will be out next week, um, and I hope that it will be of benefit uh, to small businesses, particularly small emerging businesses um, and startups, which um, have had a, a fairly difficult time, particularly those people who started their business um, in the, the very uh, recent past. Um, in terms of gaps of, in the scheme, um, these schemes will never cover everybody. Um, the, the business community here is very wide, very diverse, um, and encompasses a huge uh, section uh, of businesses. We used uh, the rate system because we could easily identify businesses in the first instance. Um, we extended the, the 10K scheme to include small uh, derated businesses, um, and we now are working our way through the 25K scheme. And as I promised this House, um, I um, have ensured that we are paying those businesses in the 25K scheme as quickly as we can verify their applications. Clearly, um, we need to ensure that applications uh, are verified and we are paying those as quickly as possible. From memory, I think that we have over 3,000 applications in uh, the 25K scheme, and over 800 of those have been paid in the two weeks since it launched. Um, in terms of those business who further um, fall um, um, out, in, uh, outside the gaps of the current funding, um, one of the ways that we can support business is through the rate system. Um, and in the rate system um, in Northern Ireland, the executive has already approved a three months uh, rate relief for everybody. Now, if those businesses were in England, Scotland and Wales, that uh, relief would be targeted only at the businesses in tourism, leisure, hospitality. Um, and uh, so therefore, um, we have ensured that more people in the first three months have, have uh, benefited from uh, rate relief. I have said this in this chamber before I can say it again. It is my personal view 
um, that uh, extending the rate relief so that it matches other parts of the United Kingdom is incredibly important and will be useful. But I also recognise the problem that the finance minister and the executive has in that we have a limited amount of money which um, has to be targeted. This week, um, and I apologise, for, but I do want to try to give full answers to these. These are very important issues that I know will come up again. Um, so this week I um, had a conference call um, between the First Deputy First Minister, the Finance Minister, Ulster University um, and myself, um, and they are doing a piece of work about how we might extend rate relief in Northern Ireland. And I think that's a very important uh, piece of work and the Finance uh, Minister will bring a paper around that in due course. Um, in planning for recovery, um, I have tried um, to re-energise uh, the economic advisory group that is part of the department and was part of the department in all of my predecessors' times. Um, we are looking at a range of people um, for that. No names, no one has been appointed yet. But we are looking at a range of people, including those people that I met uh, when I went uh, to New York and Washington um, a few weeks ago, because we are trying to establish the group, not just about Northern Ireland businesses, but about the wider global environment that Northern Ireland uh, will uh, be part of um, and has to compete in. So we have our East Coast uh, Economic Advisory Group and we're going to try to bring them into that. Um, I am very happy to cooperate um, with uh, our neighbours in the Republic of Ireland. Um, that is not a problem for me and there is a very well identified uh, cross-border bodies for that sort of work. Does the chair of the committee wish to ask a brief supplementary? A brief supplementary with a brief answer. Brief supplementary. Um, Minister, thank you very much for that answer. It was, it was very comprehensive. I'd just like to pick up very briefly on the, um, the micro businesses that will be able to access it. And you mentioned they, they would need to be um, businesses and paid through PAYE. And I would just highlight you, you said yourself around startups, those um, self employed people who have set up in the past year who are unable to access the, the income support scheme, and perhaps that they could be looked at as part of, of the hardship fund. Gramagut. can be as long as they have and they are paid through their business but if they are self-employed then that's that's an entirely different category but if they're paid through their business yes i call gary middleton mr deputy speaker and can i thank the minister for her statement uh, today uh, the minister will be aware that the economy committee heard from four of the chambers of commerce uh, yesterday quite a number of issues were raised but they were thankful for the support that has been provided already uh, one of the key issues is around the job retention scheme uh, and the furloughing of staff uh, would the minister be able to assure them that uh, we will look at maybe tapering that scheme as we go forward. Some uh, businesses will open sooner rather than later uh, and they need support to, to ensure that they can uh, keep people on the scheme. Um, well, the job retention scheme, um, thank you for the question. The job retention scheme um, is a national scheme. It is a reserved matter um, run by the Chancellor. But this week I've had two conversations with Minister Zahawi and uh, the Business Secretary, Alak Sharma. Um, and in all of those conversations, I have highlighted to them the need to avoid that cliff edge um, as the job retention scheme um, will come to an end. We cannot and should not expect government uh, to continue to intervene in the way that it currently is, but neither can we have uh, the cliff edge and therefore mass redundancies that that might bring if the job retention scheme is suddenly cut um, at, at a, a particular point. Um, I am comforted, I think is the word, um, by some of the words um, from uh, the Chancellor. I think they recognise uh, the particular issue, but certainly from the conversations I have had uh, with local companies, um, I think it would be very difficult um, to have a, a, a very stark uh, cut-off date for that scheme and um, I will continue to work with government to do that and make those representations at the highest level. Again, can I remind everyone that there are
approximately 20 more members wishing to ask questions and receive an answer. So I'll give you a quick supplementary and a quick answer, please, Minister. I briefly thank the Minister for that. Uh, can the Minister assure us that obviously time is of the essence and, and businesses really are under severe pressure? Will the Minister ins ensure that this uh, is addressed as soon as possible uh, with the UK Government? I will. As, as I say, it's part of an ongoing conversation that I have. Um, I think perhaps the House would like to know that I think that possibly as a devolved administration, we have had unprecedented access uh, to UK government ministers over the period of this crisis. And just yesterday, I think I spoke to four of them. And uh, earlier in the week, we had a teleconference between many of the major business organisations and representatives in Northern Ireland, Mr Zahawi and the Northern Ireland office, all reiterating these points. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement today. Um, in your statement, you mentioned the importance of interconnected uh, supply chains and support networks, and also your focus on the future. Um, so my question today is, does your part department have more or less officials working on preparations uh, for the ending of the transitional uh, arrangements with the U EU than it did, say, for example, six months ago? And can you give the Assembly your assurances that your department is fully prepared for the end of that transition period? Well, I know that the member, um, and I thank her for her question, but I know that the member will understand that over the last uh, number of weeks, the department has been incredibly focused um, on uh, the issues of COVID-19, uh, on how we might uh, preserve life um, and uh, keep uh, the economy uh, in, in, in some shape of readiness uh, for a return to work. So a lot of my officials have been doing an enormous amount of work and I want to hear publicly thank them for that because I think that they have uh, been taking a lot of strain um, in relation to this particular issue. Um, we have and continue to have a dedicated unit of officials um, who are working on EU exit matters um, and I was engaging with them on a number of issues this week and we will continue to engage um, as uh, this progresses. The member slipped in two questions there. I call John Stewart. Very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her statements thus far? I especially welcome the hardship grant and look forward to the details of that. Um, 19,000 companies have received that £10,000 grant to date, which is great, but thousands are still remaining to get that. Can I ask the Minister, will she either confirm that those will receive that money before the deadline of the 20th of May, or that, that deadline will be cancelled in order for those companies to um, get some clarity? Thank you. The 20th of May is not a deadline to pay. The 20th of May is just simply a deadline to close the scheme. So the scheme for both the 10K and the 25K grants uh, will close on the 20th of May. And I would encourage um, all members here today to make it widely known in their constituency that this is still available, that they can still apply um, and that it will be open for them. Call John Stewart for supplementary. Minister, no, I think I appreciate that, but for many of those businesses, they're finding it very difficult to either see if the, their application has been submitted or is being progressed um, because there is no dedicated helpline. Um, can I also ask, would you be looking at the op opportunity for an appeal mechanism for those companies that have been turned down? On the back of the portal being launched last week, there were quite a lot of companies that have been unable to avail the scheme, even though they seem to meet all the criteria and have been told they're ineligible and have no right of reply. Thank you. Um, I certainly will. Um, I want, this is not um, a scheme to exclude people. It is a scheme to include people. I want as many as possible. My uh, stats tell me that uh, 19,000, just over 19,000 10K grants have been um, paid out, out of just over 21,000 applications. I call Andrew Muir. Much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her statement. One of the concerns I have around the economic crisis that we're now enduring is the impact upon young people. Young people were hit very, very hard as a result of the last uh, crisis in 2008 onwards, and now they're being hit hard here, and we're seeing projections of very high levels of unemployment. I just want to ask the Minister what engagement she's had with stakeholders around this issue and whether she's considering designing a specific intervention package, such as a future jobs fund. 
Thank you um, for that very, very important question. Um, and I, I think it, it is, is hugely that we are mindful that many of the people who were most impacted by the economic crisis following 2008, 2009 were young people who could not get employment, young graduates who could not uh, get appropriate levels of employment and so on. So um, absolutely at the top of my agenda. I um, am in regular contact um, with um, our two universities, um, with all of the fur uh, further education colleges. In fact, I was at uh, the Southern College in its campus in Lurgan this week, um, looking how, how young people and staff um, are making visors and, and really helping out and being very proactive in helping out uh, in this particular health emergency. I have um, made provision for them uh, in terms of uh, their, the payment of their EMAs and their training allowances, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, for training providers uh, for young people um, who are, are not uh, within the colleges, we have continued to pay those because we want to make sure that training providers are still in place to make sure that they um, are able uh, to continue to train and, and provide for our young people. In terms of uh, university students, um, I have spoken and taken calls uh, from uh, student uh, representatives. Um, I have uh, proposed a further extension of the Student Hardship Fund. Um, that paper, again, is, is waiting further consideration uh, from the executive. And in terms of training, which I think is really important at this minute in time, one of, the, one of our companies has just uh, completed uh, an online academy um, for the, the financial services sector. Um, I am continuously um, promoting those pieces of work that will help us upskill um, for people um, who are young, not so young, and, and everybody else um, to get them back into work after this period of time being further upskilled. And this week we were uh, exploring uh, more online academies for young people to try to make sure that they have the right skills to get back into the workplace at the right period of time. I call Andrew Muir for supplementary. For a detailed response, I think it's important that a package is put together similar to what was put together in 2008-9 around young people. You mentioned the whole issue in relation to universities. Is the Minister prepared to explore the uh, lifting of the cap for Northern Ireland students? We've already seen the situation where forecasts of international students is going to drop. There's a likelihood that students from Northern Ireland are going to want to study locally. And how can we consider that we can support our universities around that? Thank you again. Um, another. Um, really important issue. Um, we have two institutions, two universities that I think that we can be really very proud of in Northern Ireland. Just last weekend, uh, the university's package came out uh, from the Minister uh, and the Secretary of State um, nationally. I have some reservations, as I said in my press statement, around that package. Um, there are um, admissions criteria, which I think uh, are possibly uh, not that advantageous to universities uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, we need to ensure that our universities have really good access to qualitative, uh, to research funding so that we can provide that good qualitative research that not only enhances university and academic life but drives our economy. And many companies come to Northern Ireland because of that particular issue. Um, so I've been doing some work around that and uh, members will be interested to know I had a long conversation uh, with both Minister Donlan and Minister Soloway yesterday, um, who uh, are part of the education uh, ministers in London, um, and uh, around how Northern Ireland can be part of uh, those all of those research funds, and in particular have access to re research funding going forward. I've had uh, conversations with both um, um, the universities around um, admissions and around the importance um, of uh, international students um, in uh, bringing much, much needed financial resources to the university. So that has been on our agenda as well. The lifting of the cap is a huge issue for Northern Ireland. And, um, we would need to look at that in the context of an overall strategic review um, of uh, university funding and university places. Um, so I don't see it as a short-term issue, but I see that as a much longer-term issue in uh, the, the strategic review. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her efforts to date in supporting the local economy through this terrible crisis. In relation to grant funding, something I think a lot of our members have been very active on recently, uh, the issue that comes up regularly is the support of multiple sites, multiple units uh, by locally owned businesses uh, throughout Northern Ireland. Can we get some indication of the possibility of extending the 10K grant or the 25K grant to um, support multiple units? I understand in Scotland there is an incremental scheme going, first of all, in full payment. The members asked this question. We may get supplementary. Second. Minister. And also in England. Um, can I thank the member for his question? I, of course, am very alive uh, to the issue of one business having multiple sites. But the decision was taken by the executive in order to get uh, money to as many businesses as possible that uh, this would be one grant per business um, as opposed to one grant per outlet. However, of course, should uh, further funding become available, it is an issue that we can always consider. I call Gordon Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the uh, Minister. Following on in relation just to the grants, the grant that was announced last week, could we get some further clarification on the 10,000 grant that is for sub-rented properties? There seems to be a lot of difficulty people getting access to it because it's, it, the criteria is too complex and the limitation on the NAV is, I believe, 1590, less than 1590, which is not of much good to the most of people out there. I would ask that that is reviewed, if possible, please. Thank you. Well, of course, I can write uh, to the member specifically on this uh, particular issue. Um, he is quite right that it is a, a more complex issue. Last week, what we did was put a, an additional page on the portal so that those properties um, and those businesses who rented their properties from a, a landlord could access the funding uh, much more easily as opposed to um, the landlord um, in any way uh, getting uh, the, the 10,000. So it's about trying to get money to real businesses in real time um, and uh, as promptly as possible. Thank you. I call Linda Dillon. Thank you, the Minister, for her statement. And I was wondering if the Minister could confirm if the £10,000 grant scheme could be extended to engineering and manufacturing firms who currently don't qualify due to their NAV? So can I thank the member for the question? Um, the, the 10 grant scheme has been extended to those properties uh, or to those businesses who currently uh, benefit from industrial derating. So in a way, there has been a, 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 a major um, extension of the scheme. We think that that um, actually brings about two and a half to 3,000 more businesses into the scheme. Um, so it has already been extended. I um, have no um, hesitation in saying um, that were more money to become available, we have already done work uh, to identify other cohorts of businesses that could benefit uh, from support, um, but it will be uh, around the amount of money that the executive makes available uh, for this particular project. As we speak at this moment in time, around £410 million has been brought forward um, for this particular type of support. And while it has been really very, very valuable, we also must look um, at the issues of what businesses will need to recover, how we will need and um, the support that we will need uh, to help the economy recover, recover uh, and get businesses back on its feet again. Um, and my conversations at the Tourism Steering Group yesterday uh, would indicate that there is a lot of work to be done on that. I call Linda Dillon for supplementary. I actually I appreciate the fact that it was extended to, to those businesses that are, are have manufacturing de and industrial de rating. That has been certainly been helpful to me in my constituency of Mid Ulster. However, I would ask that the Minister look at extending it further to those businesses that are small in nature but have a larger nav due to the nature of their business engineering, particularly in my constituency of Mid Ulster, because there's a large engineering industry there. It is the lar we have the largest 
VAT registered businesses outside of Belfast City. Those are businesses that are indigenous, that aren't going to go anywhere. They're not global. They're not foreign direct investment. They're businesses that grew during times that were very, very difficult. And the we the members asked their question. Around. Okay, Minister. Yes, can I thank uh, the member for a question? So these are really businesses um, who probably fall between the 15 and uh, 51 um, uh, category. Um, yes, we have done work to identify those businesses um, and uh, potentially if uh, we were to get money to uh, become available, that is a second tier of the hardship fund that we could bring forward relatively uh, easily. I call Keith Buchanan. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her statement so far. My sort of question relates around tourism. You obviously spoke briefly on it there. Can you give us an update on what sort of support you're going to give that industry across Northern Ireland? I think, uh, can I thank the member for his question? I think it is really hard uh, to quantify um, the impact of COVID-19 on the tourism industry. Um, I keep saying this, and sometimes I have to say it over to myself again. Um, just a few short weeks ago, I was in um, New York and, and Washington, D.C., talking to tour operators, um, and we were talking about um, expanding uh, the tourism uh, that we do and the tourism market for Northern Ireland in North America. Today, we have no connecting flights um, anywhere on this island. Um, to that particular destination. And for those people who come to us because they are from the Far East and they follow particular um, and, and they come for particular reasons around Game of Thrones or whatever they come, that is, is the impact has been devastating. Our cruise industry um, through Belfast Harbour um, has been devastated by that as well. But at home, many local small businesses have equally been uh, devastated. So many of those businesses um, in the tourism sector will have been able to avail of uh, the 10K grants. Um, of course, the 25K grants um, is um, specifically directed at the tourism sector. So no matter what element of that tourism sector you're part of, if you have an NAV that falls within those um, those limits, um, then you can apply for that. It's specifically directed at you. Um, and I know that some of the work uh, that the Finance Minister has been doing on rates extension applies specifically to the tourism industry. If we are to get real and meaningful help to some of the bigger operators um, who have uh, large um, um, investments in tourism in Northern Ireland, then that's uh, one of the ways that we can do it. Um, we also have set up uh, a tourism steering group. That's a, a quite a wide body encompassing a lot of the industry, tourism and hospitality industry. Um, and yesterday I chaired uh, the first of their small working group um, meetings. That is going to be run for us by uh, Tourism NI. John McGrillan, the chief executive, is going to take that forward. Um, and they are going to identify the supports uh, that will be needed uh, for us uh, to take tourism back uh, to where it needs to be. It's time to rebuild it. It's a hugely important industry for Northern Ireland. 65,000 jobs and last year one billion into the economy. Keith Buchanan for supplementary, and we do need concise questions and Thank answers. Thank you. Uh, there's not much uh, caravans, parks and mudals, as I'm sure you're aware, but I've talked about some up around the north coast who fall outside the 51,000. Therefore, no support them. Has the Minister been in any communication with that caravanning sector that they will get additional support based on the fact they're above the 51? Well, I have had um, numerous um, conversations with uh, some of the, the owners. Caravan parks essentially are private businesses, um, and they will fall into that tourism and hospitality sector. So that if there is further targeted rates relief, then they will fall into that as well. I call Cahill Boylan. Carla, and thank the Minister for the uh, statement. Just when we listen to some of the businesses reopening and a phased return to work, those businesses who are client facing the likes of dentists, the likes of hairdressers and even the taxi industry, is the Minister going to issue a sector specific guidance so that when they return they can operate safely? And I thank the member for a very pertinent question and uh, very topical. Um, over the past um, two weeks, 
I have been working and my department has been working uh, with uh, Bayes uh, in London um, and they are working on um, working safer plans so that when we are ready to return, when the restrictions are lifted, when we are ready to return, that there will be um, plans in place uh, for various sectors in that working safer environment. And of course, we will then look at those as they're published nationally and bring them back to Northern Ireland uh, and look at them in the context in which we operate here. So yes, it's very, very much on my mind um, and something that uh, my department's officials have been working on um, and uh, work that we continue to do um, in preparation for restarting, rebooting and recovering this economy. I call Cahill Boylan for a supplementary. Hey, Gormag, and and could I thank the Minister for her answer and just following on from some of the things she said in the statement. We welcome all the grants, we welcome all the support, but the taxi industry has one of the industries that's been crying out for support and it feels they're, they're being hard hit. So is there anything in line in the hardship fund or all the grants that the Minister can outline today that would support the taxis industry? Thank you. Um, yes, I recognise and, and some of the industries like taxing um, it is very, very difficult um, for them in the current environment. If uh, they are paid, if they're a small company and they're paid through a PAYE scheme, then the hardship grant will uh, be applicable to them um, and they will be able to apply for it. Um, but we need to see, each one will have to assess against the criteria whether they're eligible or not. I call Matthew Tull. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for coming and giving us an update today. I appreciate everything she said about um, the road to recovery and, um, uh, and the importance of engaging with business in various sectors in terms of, of that recovery. In her engagement with various business groups, and she specifically mentioned the durability of supply chains, she specifically mentioned hauliers, have any of them indicated to you that they would prefer the UK to crash out of the transition period without a deal over an extension to that transition period? My conversation with Holliers at this particular time, uh, for the members' information, um, has been consistently around the need to uh, ensure safe supply chains for Northern Ireland of vital supplies of food, medicine, uh, and uh, supply chain um, imperatives. Um, that has been uh, my most uh, recent conversation. Um, this week, and in fact, actually tomorrow, um, I will again be discussing with uh, the Department for Transport in London um, around a package uh, for hauliers. Um, we have um, been successful and done a lot of work in trying to stabilise um, air, airports and airlines. We have worked quite hard around the ferries issue. Um, and the, the outstanding bit of that jigsaw puzzle is, is the issue around hauliers. So I do assure the, uh, the member that at this minute in time, I think that uh, operating at a huge loss is uppermost in their mind. Can I remind members that this is the COVID-19 ad hoc committee. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, thank you for your words today and your efforts of yourself, your department, and indeed the entire executive uh, trying to help local businesses. Today, you did uh, state that uh, businesses have adapted once more, demonstrating agility and resilience in the face of adversity. They have stepped up to the challenge by doing what is necessary. We're now four to five weeks post application for financial assistance to businesses. Could the minister outline any thoughts or actions her department has had in adapting and demonstrating that same agility uh, to refine and improve the processing system, to make it much more informative and live, to give real-time information to those applications for the many thousands of businesses that haven't received their financial assistance yet? Um, can I thank the member for his question? Um, and I do um, also want to say thank you to the House in general um, for the support um, that is forthcoming. These are difficult days, um, and uh, many of my officials have been working uh, very, very um, hard uh, on these issues. Many of the schemes um, that we've been doing um, are, have been implemented very, very quickly. And the essence uh, of our mission was to get uh, money to businesses as quickly as we could. Um, we may not have been as informative as we could have been, and I accept that, um, and perhaps uh, we can remedy that. 
Um, and I think that it would be useful also to share with members um, some of the stats around uh, where we are with the economy uh, so that we members will know the steep path that we need to climb uh, to economic recovery. Um, and that uh, <coughs> is hugely important. The, if you go to the Northern Ireland Business Info website, you will find a wealth of information um, on all of the help uh, that is available. And Invest NI have been uh, tasked with making sure that that is up to date um, and, and so on. And for uh, businesses who, who um, have, are encountering difficulties, they have also been uh, conducting webinars with businesses to explain the various schemes and try uh, and get them uh, up running. But I have been absolutely clear and upfront uh, with this House around the numbers of the grants applied for, the numbers of the grants paid, the dates when those grants will end, um, and uh, how we go forward. I call Robbie Butler for a brief supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and I thank you that you've uh, said that you would indeed look at that. Um, just simply, what plans have you made to support large companies who have at this point been excluded from all government assistance to date companies with an NAV of over 50,000 uh, and plus 15 employees? Thank you. Again, um, and as I've said to this House many times, I think that for many of those large companies, um, um, extending rates relief, particularly in the tourism and hospitality sector. But of course, those companies have also benefited from uh, the National Job Retention Scheme, where many of them uh, will have workers furloughed. Some of our uh, statistics show us that many companies um, have 70 to 80 per cent of their workforce um, actually furloughed through those schemes. Just yesterday, I was speaking uh, to some of our leading banking institutions and asking them how some of those schemes were, uh, the, the loan schemes uh, from government were going. Uh, the original Seabills loan scheme had uh, quite significant difficulties, um, but I'm assured that given uh, the modifications that were made by the Chancellor, um, that much more money is going back out into the business community very, very quickly. Um, in one of the banking institutions that I was talking to yesterday, they had, from Monday, they had received 1,100 um, applications for the bounce back loan, the loan for small and medium um, enterprises. Um, 600 of those had already been approved by Wednesday. Um, so, and, and of course they are 100% uh, guaranteed by government with no interest uh, for a year. So many of our businesses um, are benefiting uh, in, in, in different ways. I call Paul Given. Deputy Speaker and uh, Minister for coming to the Assembly today. Uh, in terms of the planning for restarting the economy and businesses knowing when they can start to engage again in their activity, some businesses are already reopening. They're allowed to do so within the regulations. Does the Minister agree with me that we need to provide information to facilitate that decision-making processes for business owners as soon as possible? Yes. Um, is the short answer, um, but um, if I'm permitted a longer answer, <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, um, the, the, yes, of course we do. As I've already referenced, I've been working with Bayes in London around safer workspaces. Of course, in Northern Ireland, we're a little bit ahead of the curve, um, and we already have some guidance uh, from uh, the Engagement Forum chaired by the Labour Relations Agency, and uh, which is an amalgamation of uh, the trade unions and businesses coming together to set out uh, for uh, our good um, practical advice and guidance um, on how to work safely. Um, the Health and Safety Executive and the Public Health Agency has also continued uh, to work with businesses um, to uh, advise them and enable them to get back to work and to work safely, and particularly within the social distancing guidelines. It is worth um, using this platform, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, with your indulgence, um, to actually say that for those employers um, who um, are, are going back to work, it is imperative that the workplace is safe and that social distancing guidelines are met and kept. Paul Given for supplementary. 
Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. Earlier, the Minister indicated that the financial scheme is being administrated through the rate system, and I can appreciate and understand why that was the case at the start to get money out. But there are businesses that are falling through the cracks on the basis of that scheme being used. Uh, can the Minister assure those businesses that there will be support uh, for them when they are identified as legitimate businesses that are operating in Northern Ireland? I, of course, uh, want to support legitimate businesses operating in Northern Ireland. That is a fundamental uh, for me. Um, as I have said before, um, there are many and varied businesses uh, in uh, the Northern Ireland business community. Um, we used uh, the rates um, scheme because uh, identifying those businesses was easier, getting money out to them was easier, etc., uh, etc. Et we have extended those schemes uh, in certain ways, and next week we will launch uh, a hardship scheme as well. My uh, department is continuously doing work to identify other cohorts of businesses. But as you will realise, um, we live in an environment where we have a limited amount of financial resources, um, and I will continue to make the case to the executive for continued support uh, for many of those businesses. I call Catherine Kelly. Can I ask the minister, does she agree that rural broadband improvements must be prioritised by her department? in order to ensure that workers can work from home in these unprecedented times? I um, absolutely am passionate about ensuring um, that uh, broadband um, is uh, brought up to speed in Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, just a few weeks ago, we got confirmation uh, that another tranche of the confidence and supply money um, would be made available to the executive um, to use for the project Stratum um, uh, project. The good news uh, for the House today is that we now have two bids in uh, for that particular uh, project. Um, I um, obviously have no part in this, but um, those bids will be assessed. And if there is someone, um, as if it becomes suitable, um, we hope that we will be awarding a contract um, about for those um, in the reasonably uh, near future, but certainly by September, that, uh, that we will get to contract award point. Um, and then it will take some time for assessments uh, and out to delivery on the ground. This is a very important project for Northern Ireland. One of the things that uh, COVID-19 has taught us is that we will potentially do business differently than we have ever done before. Um, many of us, and even old technophobes like me, um, have become proficient at using Zoom and, and, and Microsoft Teams and all sorts of things that we never thought we would use. Um, we will not do business the same again. Connectivity will be key. I call Catherine Kelly for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? The Minister will be aware of the campaign advocating for all Ireland right to connectivity. This campaign calls on internet providers to open up all hotspots cost free and to waive the prohibitive charges for households who are unable to, unable to access decent broadband connection. Will the Minister support this campaign? Um, I haven't the details of that particular campaign, but um, it clearly uh, is uh, out there and very well known. And I, I wrote and I will write uh, to the member um, shortly um, outlining all of the different schemes that we have um, to uh, try and improve rural broadband connectivity uh, in uh, the, the medium to short term. And I will write with all of those schemes. Um, it's quite an impressive list. I call Paula Bradshaw. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for coming to the Chamber today. Um, I would just declare an interest from the outset. My husband stood down from Northern Ireland Screen Board in the last year, and I note that today the Chief Executive has issued a statement setting out in very stark terms the impact on that sector. So my question is really around what is your department going to do to support them now and going forward in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have had uh, conversations with uh, both the Chair and Chief Executive of Northern Ireland Screen, 
um, and they have recently put proposals to the department for some reprofiling of their budget in order to go out and help uh, some of those independent people uh, who work within the sector and others to help young people um, with uh, digital improvements uh, that, they, that they can uh, make uh, to their skills. Um, so we are currently working with Northern Ireland Screen um, and uh, that is where their latest proposal is and we will of course look on that favourably. Um, the, the TV and film industry brings an enormous amount to Northern Ireland, um, not just in terms of money into the economy but also in terms of that kind of international um, renowned and many of us um, have followed some of the series um, in, uh, that have been made in Northern Ireland. I want to see that capacity preserved um, and I want to see Northern Ireland once again uh, producing really quality programmes um, for us all to enjoy. I call Paula Bradshaw for supplementary. No, no thank you. I'm satisfied with the answer. And I call Paul Frew. Mr Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for coming here today to this committee to give this statement. The Minister in her statement states that it is very important to keep the lights on. Uh, could the Minister provide an update on the very troublesome news in Northern Ireland Electricity Networks, whereby they are in negotiations with staff and unions to put them on to a four-day week with a 20 per cent reduction in pay? And also, can the Minister give an update on the ongoing troublesome issue with Sony and its governance and independence? Can I thank the member for his question and for his continued interest in these particular uh, issues? Uh, yes, you are quite right um, around the issue um, of reduction to a four-day week. Currently in Northern Ireland, the actual um, amount of electricity that we use, because manufacturing is not um, operating at its level, is reduced by about 20 per cent. Um, and uh, that is a difficulty and may well prove a difficulty, as the member knows, because um, of uh, his interest in this area um, as we go forward in terms of the price of electricity. And that, I think, is something for us all to be very, very concerned about. I am, of course, very concerned about any reduction uh, in workers' uh, salaries, wages, or uh, terms and conditions of employment. I understand that this is still a matter uh, of negotiation with the unions uh, and something that I don't want to be specific about. In terms of Sony, I, of course, have been monitoring this issue very, very closely. Um, I uh, want to see an independent uh, system um, in Northern Ireland. Um, so um, I continue to liaise uh, with the utility regulator in this and in the work that she's doing, but it is something that I will keep a consistent uh, eye upon, something that I think is important to the governance of the energy market going forward. The members asked us two questions. I move on to John O'Dowd. With last, can call you and thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Uh, there, there's an important section of our society missing from your statement students uh, and support for students moving forward. I note from comments from your officials at last week's uh, Economy Committee that you are reprofiling your business plan and you note at the start of your statement that things haven't gone the way you would have hoped they had. So is there savings to be identified in your department and if so, will you direct some of those towards Student Hardship Fund? Can I thank the member for his question and again for his continued interest in this particular issue? Um, as I outlined to um, our uh, other uh, colleague, um, I have been uh, taking a, a, a very um, strong interest in the issues of students, not just uh, their education, but also how um, they, uh, their welfare is uh, while they're at universities. Um, as with all departments, um, we will be looking to where we can make savings. Uh, to what we can reprofile um, and uh, how we can uh, make the best uh, of, of where we are now in terms of uh, continuing mitigations but also in support and recovery uh, mode. That work is ongoing um, and will come to fruition uh, with the June monitoring round uh, which is not that far off at this particular time. However, in the meantime, I thought it was prudent uh, that I alert executive colleagues to this particular issue. 
Um, I have sent up um, a paper uh, to the executive uh, which outlines that if we had another 2.5 million, um, then that would double the amount of support that we would uh, be giving into student hardship funds um, and uh, would bring us in line with Scotland and other parts of the United Kingdom. So far, that bid has not been successful, uh, but I will assure the member that I will continue to press it. Call John O'Dowd for supplementary. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the answer. And, and I welcome the fact that the matter is still on the minister's radar, and it, it hopefully will be dealt with. In relation to another matter in the minister's statement, the Economic Advisory Group, will the minister commit to placing a member of the trade union movement on that group? Because representatives of workers moving forward will be as important as any other voice in rejuvenating our economy. I absolutely agree um, that we need of always to work with our social partners uh, and trade unions uh, in our community. The Economic Advisory Group as yet is not formed. I don't have a list of members for it at this minute in time. However, my vision for it is a group of people who are really world leaders in their sector who can tell us how we drive those sectors forward. We have a world leading um, cutting edge cyber security sector in Northern Ireland. I really want the advice, the guidance and so on from people who can really drive those sectors forward that make the difference in providing not just more jobs but better jobs for Northern Ireland that keep young graduates uh, in work uh, and keep, us, keep our economy turning over. So that is my vision for it. But I don't want it to be just Northern Ireland uh, specific. I wanted to look at the more global pattern and that's why when I was in the States um, earlier in, in March, uh, we re-established the East Coast Advisory Council, which is a number of, of really key businessmen who are part of the Northern Ireland diaspora, but who have done very well uh, in the United States um, and who are very keen to help economic development at home. So that's my vision for the Economic Advisory Council. And I really want to, us to use their expertise and help us have, a, you know, build those leading edge businesses um, that will drive the economy forward and which will feed into some important piece of work that we have to do um, over the next, before this mandate ends, and that is to provide a really good economic strategy to drive the Northern Ireland economy for the future. I call Colm McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, many of the self-employed business people will have furloughed the staff and they will have paid the bills, but because there is no business, they are not getting an income themselves. Can the Minister detail any conversations that she has had with London to get assurances that that scheme will pay out soon? These people have gone weeks and weeks and weeks without any money and they are desperate. Can I thank the member for his question. This is something that I bring up regularly in my conversations uh, with the BES ministers and indeed uh, with some of the wider telephone uh, calls that we do with the Chancellor. Um, there is a, a particular issue that uh, some of these people have been at the back end um, of, of the, the queue. Um, I suppose, in, in fairness, we have to admit that um, the job retention scheme is an absolutely massive undertaking for HMRC um, and that uh, people who applied to it some of the firms tell me they literally had the money in their bank account six days later, which is an absolute phenomenal achievement. Um, I now understand that HMRC are writing out to those self-employed people um, who are eligible for the scheme and that it is well underway. But be assured, it's something that I am cognizant of and will continue to make representation about. I call Colin McGrath for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Given the destructive impact of COVID-19 on these businesses, does the Minister agree with me that um, it will place an impossible burden on them if we crash out of the EU with no deal? I think that uh, most businesses in Northern Ireland are fearful uh, for the future. Um, they worry about the impact of COVID-19 um, and they worry um, about uh, where the market will be um, as they try uh, to re-establish and recover. And that goes for all sectors uh, of the economy. Um, at this moment in time, there are still ongoing negotiations um, with uh, the European Union. My understanding is that 
Last week, uh, the specialised committee met um, and uh, discussed some of the issues uh, that were uh, particular to Northern Ireland um, and that those uh, negotiations are ongoing. I think it's way too premature uh, to talk of anything else. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for coming here to make a statement. I note that you have stated that the top priority is still the protection of life. And in light of this, could the Minister uh, provide any clarity on what is deemed by the Executive to be a priority sector for the purposes of construction, as stated on the list of priority business sectors that was published by the Department for Economy on the 20th of April? It's very, very simple. Um, the most important thing that uh, this executive has tried to do is to um, save life um, and uh, protect people from the impact of COVID-19. That has been devastated and there are many, many families in Northern Ireland that have felt the pain of COVID-19. I am very clear that whatever the sector, whatever the sector, if that sector is working, if that firm is working, employers have a duty to employees to maintain a safe working environment. There is um, advice um, that we have published um, on uh, the website uh, around that safe working environment. And if there uh, are still questions from uh, employers about what that looks like, then the Public Health Agency and the HSE will absolutely engage with those employers in order to, do, uh, to make sure that they have a safe working environment. Um, and that is uh, an absolute imperative. And um, it is worth noting that many, many of our employers, particularly in the food uh, industry, have gone to enormous lengths with a lot of um, expense to ensure that they have provided a safe working environment, not just in physical measures, but in um, reorientating shifts, clock-ons, etc., etc., canteen arrangements uh, in their factory. These will become the new normal. It will be things that we will have to do for a significant period of time to come, um, and we all need to be cognisant of that. Call Rachel Woods for supplementary. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. Um, could the Minister clarify how the construction industry is supposed to adequately socially distance while working on a building site? And if this cannot be achieved, where possible or to the best of their ability, as it is in the guidance, could the Minister confirm that that means workers should not be there, given the health risks? As I have said uh, to the member, the guidance is there for, uh, you know, to, to help people understand what they must do. There will be more specific guidance that can be obtained by contacting the health and safety executive, and all employers should uh, attend to that. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Minister in her statement said we need to be decisive in our policy choices. When will we see that decisiveness in terms of reopening our economy? She said our economy is in the deep, in the deep freeze. Is it not the case that if we go on as we are much longer, everything in the freezer will be lost. I, of course, uh, share the member's concern uh, for the economy. Um, and um, I have done everything um, I can to try to get help out to businesses with the funds that have been available to me. Um, there um, will be an, an 410 million available for businesses um, in support funds. Um, there's an enormous amount of work has gone into uh, cooperating with national government uh, over um, the job retention schemes, the self-employed schemes, the loan schemes uh, that are available to support businesses. All of these have done, been done with a speed of intervention that probably um, is unheard of um, for uh, government sources. However, um, it is absolutely imperative that we are led by the science and that we are led um, with uh, the medical uh, experts who tell us uh, about uh, the need to save life um, and preserve life in Northern Ireland. So I am keen to see the economy restart. I have already said that where people can work safely um, and within the guidelines and within the regulations, then they should do that. 
um, and I will uh, be continuing my work of preparation for rebooting and recovering the economy. I call Jim Allister for supplementary. Does the Minister accept that as and when, hopefully sooner rather than later, we reopen the economy, that that must be in tandem with reopening our schools so as to provide for working parents? I, of course, accept um, that uh, schools and the reopening of schools does have an impact uh, on parents' uh, availability uh, for the economy. Again, we must be led uh, by what is best for the health uh, of people in Northern Ireland. Uh, and, of course, the executive and the education minister will take the view on when schools should open. I call Jerry Carl. Uh, thank you. The Minister will be aware, no doubt, that Queen's University are reporting potential losses of up to £80 million and also University up to £64 million over three years. And at the Economy Committee last week, uh, VCs of both Queen's and UU forecasted significant loss of income for their institutions as a result of the coronavirus crisis. Can I ask the Minister, uh, can she confirm that a tuition fee increase will not be an option considered to plug this gap? Um, as I uh, indicated to an earlier question um, around the lifting of the cap on student numbers, any uh, of these issues would be part uh, of a much, much wider um, and much more long-term review um, of um, how higher education is funded in Northern Ireland. I am also on record as saying that I do not believe students should be first in line to be targeted in order to provide uh, funding uh, for universities. These are long-term issues that we will take forward. However, in the short term, I would say that I have had significant conversations uh, with the Minister for Un responsible for universities in London, uh, yesterday with the Minister responsible for research and innovation, um, and uh, with the universities themselves as to the need for a stabilisation package potentially uh, later this year as they uh, see how things work out. I call Jerry Carl for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for her uh, reply um, and I agree with her we need a longer term view, but in my view that means one that shouldn't punish or penalise students. Um, she said in, in her previous answer that the government cannot intervene in a way that it, it's done. Um, in relation to this crisis, I think we need more government intervention, especially around education and universities. And, uh, would she agree with me that students shouldn't be penalised, especially as they have went over and beyond and have been very cooperative in terms of abiding by uh, the distancing measures today, and they shouldn't be punished in the future with buyers uh, placed in front of them in regards to higher edu education, including higher tuition fees? Um, I think I've said this to the member before, but given that I was the first in my family to go to university, I am absolutely keen that we dismantle barriers uh, to for further and higher education provision. Education open opens doors and breaks down barriers. I am keen that all members of our society benefit from that. <coughs> Could I ask any member present who hasn't asked the question who wishes to do so to rise in their, from their chair? Okay. I call Jim Wells. Uh, will the Minister join with me in congratulating the staff of HMRC who have been able to pay the salaries of over 5 million people within a week of the applications being lodged and express the thanks of many of my constituents and businesses for that? Could I, could I ask her, therefore, to contact her colleagues in the Treasury to ensure that the self employed scheme is as effectively administered as the employed scheme? Um, I thank the member uh, for his uh, request. Um, I, of course, will uh, pass on uh, that message. Um, I, as I said before in the chamber today, it's quite phenomenal um, that uh, so many... I think in the first day of the scheme, they received 68,000 applications. And many of the firms who have applied to the scheme from Northern Ireland report to me that they were paid within six days of actually inputting their details into the portal. It's quite a phenomenal achievement as well as a phenomenal uh, intervention in the economy. I look forward to the self-employed scheme being rolled out in a similar and efficient manner. And thank you. And I will, of course, pass that on. I call Jim Wells for supplementary if he wishes to do so. Honourable Member will realise that the £10,000 grant scheme was very effectively 
uh, administered by Land and Property Services. I want to pay public tribute to Tony Lachlan, who was the link officer between MLAs and the Department of Finance in this case. Would she consider appointing somewhere, someone of similar status to liaise with MLAs when dealing with the £25,000 scheme? I have had uh, a number uh, of inquiries uh, in relation to the 25,000 uh, scheme uh, and of course my officials in my department will always be happy to liaise with members uh, directly on the issue. Can I thank members for their cooperation and the Minister. That concludes questions uh, to the Minister on this occasion. Item 3 on the agenda, the time, date and place of our next meeting. We have received confirmation from the Justice Minister that she does wish to make her deferred statement to the Ad Hoc Committee meeting to be held on Thursday the 14th of May, unless otherwise noticed about an earlier meeting. This will be the next time in which uh, the Ad Hoc Committee will take place. Written notification confirming the time will be issued in due course to members in the usual way. I would remind members that in the, plenary, in, the, in the meantime, a plenary sitting of the Assembly is scheduled to take place uh, on Tuesday the 12th of May, and that Ministers may continue to make oral statements to the Assembly on sitting days, uh, and as you will be aware, there does not need to be uh, a considerable notice for that, so please uh, watch out for some, there may be some important statements being made. So that concludes today's meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee. The, the meeting is adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed.